All right, we're joining UFC uh, welting. Michael Kiesu picked up a big win in Abu Dhabi. Michael, how's it going, man? It's good. It's good. Feels good to be back in the win column. Yeah, just like going into that fight against Tony, like how much pressure was on you? Like just coming off the three losses, like you're fighting a guy that everyone kind of expects you to beat how you did. So like, was there a lot of pressure? You like, was it hard trying to not let that get to you? I mean, there's always an expectation to win every fight. Um, but you know, over the course of the last year, I've spent more time focusing kind of on the mental side of things. Um, obviously I'm always training and stuff, but I never felt like aside from Dar's defense, um, I don't really feel like it was ever a lack of skills. Uh, I think it was more just my mentality, um, kind of maybe sometimes putting too much pressure on myself, thinking about things I shouldn't be thinking about, focusing more on, on just performing my best instead of being so married to the outcome. Um, you know, that's, that's something I've worked on a lot is you got to surrender the outcome and just focus on performing your best. Because I feel like when you're so fo hyper-focused on winning, you just lose sight of like, what's most important is fighting my best, focusing on the game plan. Um, you know, even like talking about the Darce defense stuff. I know how to defend a Darce choke, but that's me panicking and not focusing on performing at my best. So I feel like I'm putting all the pieces together now and uh, I'm just really enjoying competing again. Uh, was that even like something in the back of your head where you're fighting a guy like Tony who's known for the Dars and you're like, well, it might happen here again. Like I might have to show everyone that I can do it. No, no, I, it's, that's, like I said, if I would have been focusing on that, I'm start, I'd, I'd be creating situations and problems that don't exist. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I mean, while I do say that I've been confident in my Dars defense for a long time and I haven't shown it, it's still something that I was like, you know, for the last three weeks of this camp, let's just do a little Darcy events at the end of every practice. Not like just after jujitsu, like we'd get done sparring. I'm like, hey, let's do a couple little live situations from the Darce just in case it happens. Um, you know, but it's it, in, in a fight like that, it's just go do just just stick to your bread and butter. Um, I felt very, really on that. Night. I feel like uh, I could have went back and fought any of the guys that I had lost against on that three fight losing streak. I feel like I could have went, went out and beat them because. My, my head was in the right place um, physically. Um, was, I was a good, in a good spot as well. So um, I'm excited. Like I said, I'm excited to compete again. I'm excited to get back in the mix. And the plan is to get in there before the end of the year. Uh, going into this fight against Tony, like what were your expectations for him? Just because like a guy on that big of a losing streak, you don't really know what they're like. But then you look at the guys he's losing to. Like I saw a lot of people saying like, oh, he is done. Or there's a lot of people that thought – Oh, you're just fighting like the best of the best, and you're still having success. Like, what were your kind of expectations of Tony's skills, like going into the fight and then after? Uh, well, like going into the fight, for one, I'm not training for the guy that's on the skin. I'm training for the guy that's on the 12 fight win streak. Mm -hmm. Um, but like some of those losses, like no matter what, no matter how you paint them, they're going to be a loss. But there's like a few of them I kind of put an asterisk next to. Like you look at like the Nate Diaz fight. How does that fight pan out if he doesn't have this huge gash on his shin? I mean, his shin's wide open from throwing kicks, takes away one of his best weapons, essentially. Um, and that fight's on short notice. You know, the camp itself was short notice to fight Lee Jing Leung. And then in less than 24 hours, he's fighting Nate Diaz, which is a completely different fight. Um, you know, and then it, it just like uh, the Bobby Green fight, the eye pokes. There's just certain little things that like, I'm not saying they would have changed the outcome of the fight, but it's like, maybe they really contributed into the, the fights not going his way. So, um, but it's just easy to just focus on. Like for me, the fight that I watched a lot, this camp was, uh, I will admit like going back and watching some of his recent fights, uh, I wouldn't say gave me a false sense of security, but I was definitely like, this isn't the film to watch. Um, I'm going to go back and watch the film that I was watching to prepare for him in 2016. Um, and I watched that Rafael Dos Anjos fight a lot because I feel like, that version of Tony Ferguson we saw in the octagon against Rafael Dos Anjos, I feel like he could have beat anybody in the world. I mean, I, I will go out on a limb and say I think that he could have beat Habib Nurmagomedov. If that was the version of him, I think that was his peak. His peak was RDA, and I think the descent, even though he still won fights from there, I still think it started to kind of go down a little bit. You know, um, that style comes at a price. It comes at a severe price. You know, you're really you're leaning on your chin a lot in your athleticism and, and, the, and the things that fade the most as a for a fighter like you start using your chin almost as a line of offense like you're going in there chin high eating them eat, you know taking one to give one like 
those are the things that, that diminish fast and you don't get back. So I, I looked at, I watched that fight a lot because I feel like that was the best version of him. And that was the one that would keep me up at night and keep me training hard. And um, I hope he just stops competing. I mean, I think that maybe if he wants to, to scratch that itch and compete in jujitsu, I'm sure there are a lot of jujitsu promotions that would pay Tony a lot of money to grapple. Um, I just don't want to see him take any headshots anymore, you know? Um, and that's just like speaking to a brother that I, I'm in the same fraternity with, you know, we're in the same mm-hmm. fraternity. And when I both won the ultimate fighter, I say that with compassion, you know, like you can still make money and compete in jujitsu, but I think it's, I don't think it's a financial thing for Tony. I think he's just a very fierce competitor. The guy likes to compete. He's very athletic. I just don't think he should be taking shots anymore. Yeah, I'm kind of worried like a bare knuckle or one of these promotions will throw a lot of money at him just so they can market a Tony fight because like he still is a big name. You're going to get people to watch. But I do think he probably should be done. But uh, for you, like after that fight, you didn't really say much on the mic. You let him have it. Like what kind of was the thought process behind that? Because I think a lot of people like respected you for doing that. Uh, You know, I think part of my um, part of my way of like manifesting wins is, uh, you know, come up with a name, you know, start thinking about your post fight speech. I always try to preach that, uh, you know, that's the most important part that, you know, aside from the fight itself, there's nothing more important than the 60 seconds you get on the mic afterwards. Um, you can really, if there's a message you want to send the world, it'll, it'll never be heard louder than, than after you win a fight. If there's somebody you want to fight or you want to call somebody out, same situation. Um, but I just felt like it was the right thing to do. Like I'm not in the rankings. I don't really have a name in mind like I usually do. I mean, obviously, I'm always kind of pecking it, trying to get that Colby Covington fight. Um, but it's just like one of those things. I don't have anything. So let him have his moment. It's on ABC. You know, while some people might have think that I should have taken my time and been a little more selfish, I disagree. Like I said, um, I consider myself to be in the same fraternity as Tony Ferguson. Mm-hmm. I may have not went to college, but I was on the Ultimate Fighter. You know, and like we both, we both have that um, – that common ground that not a lot of uh, many other fighters have. So I just felt like it was just time to let him have his moment. Um, Cause I'm, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure that's the last time we'll see him in the UFC. I mean, the only way you would want to keep him in the UFC is like to protect him from the people outside the UFC. Yeah. that are going to try to sign him, but uh, you know, I don't know. It's a tough situation, but I'm glad he had his moment. Um, and I wish him nothing but the best. Uh, going into that one, like just on three losses, like say you did lose to Tony, like, would you have kept on going? Do you think that would have been it for you? I would have been done. I, yeah. I mean, that's pretty simple. I'm not going to embark on that journey. You know, even if things don't go my way in, in my next fight, that doesn't mean I'm retiring. Like I'm not like one loss away from retiring. That's not it at all. But it's if, if I lose to Tony, unless it's something involving a cut or something very, very fluky, it would have been something involving me just not, not being able to execute my game from a mental standpoint than a physical standpoint. If I couldn't be sound between the ears when that octagon door closes, then I'm not going to try to chase that down. I'm not getting any younger. The fights don't get any easier. Um, so yeah, but you know, I won, so it's not even a thought anymore. And it wasn't even a thought going into it really. I mean, it was just prior to the fight. Once I booked the fight, like I'm, you know, I'm having a real serious conversation with my wife because it's like, she's along for the ride with me. And, you know, we've had this time off where, you know, I had a really tough year after the Kevin Holland fight. I thought 35 would be the best year of my life. And it was like the worst. <laughs> it was, I was very, I was very fooled to think that 35 would be the best year of my life. Um, so a lot of mental hurdles over the year, uh, a lot of depression, just battling a lot of those types of demons. Um, old family stuff resurfacing, like just a multitude of stuff. My dog, having to put my dog down, like right after the Kevin Holland fight just a lot of things, man. And, uh, before I really started to link up with my uncle Joe and just start talking about stuff, you know, we just had a conversation and I was just like, they're offering me this fight with Tony Ferguson. Like, you know, are we going to do this? And if I do, and and things don't go my way, like, are we going to retire? And she, she solely puts that on me and she supports whatever decisions I make. But just me as a competitor, yeah, if I lose four fights in a row, like, it, that's when it's like it's gonna really, really start to tarnish my legacy. You know, people will forget about the great things you've done and, and the wins you've had. Like, similar to what's happened with Tony. Like, people are forgetting the guys he's beat. People are forgetting that he was the boogeyman. They're just focused on, you know, the recency bias that comes with a lot of MMA fans. So, 
for me, I would, I would have retired, but once I got to talking to my uncle Joe and we got into camp and we started to kind of work on our mental routine, it was like, you have to just not think about that. You can't think about what comes next. You can't think about it. You just have to focus on Tony Ferguson on August 3rd. Mm-hmm. You can't think about like, if you're going to keep fighting, if you're going to retire this, that anything after August 3rd, I just shut it out of my mind. So th- that's why I felt no pressure. There was no pressure when the octagon door closed because I was just focused on the task at hand. And I think that maybe in the past, that's the pressure that's gotten me. You know, it's, it's always maybe looking too far down the line. Just a couple more things. Like I know you aren't in the rankings, but you're kind of a, you're a big name in the sport. Like I mean, you could get a ranked guy, you could get a main event. Like, is there if you don't get that Colby fight? Like, is there anyone, or is it just kind of whoever they give you at this point? You know, I'm just kind of sitting back and just seeing what they offer. I know when I want to fight. Um, I want to fight in December. Um, I, I do need to let my thumb. I, I went and got some MRIs on my thumb and my elbow on, on uh, Thursday. Waiting to hear back. I'm on those. I don't think I need any surgeries. Uh, but my thumb was pretty bad this camp. So we'll see. But my plan is December. They have a card in Tampa. It's Jimmy. It's, you know, it's the Stuart Scott show. And, you know, I usually work that Stuart Scott show, but Stuart Scott's my boy. And I think it, it's only fitting that at least sometime, you know, I, I got to fight on that event, you know, so I'm, mm-hmm. I, I'm looking to fight December 14th. And I love Tampa. I beat Benil Darius in Tampa. So I think there's something, some good mojo in the air. And my, my uncle lives out there, the one that's my sports psychologist, as well as my aunt. I think it'd be a good place for me to go compete. So December 14th, that's the date. I don't really know who I want to fight, though. I, don't, I haven't really have been thinking that much about it. Just focus on the date. Uh, the, the other thing I want to talk to you about is uh, after you, or I guess right before you won, sorry, the welterweight division at a new champ, what you make of Paul win over Leon? And did that surprise that he won? Uh, well, I mean, I think you're trying to ask if it surprised me and it didn't, uh, you know, is it easy to get lost in the first fight and focus on that mm-hmm. first fight and think that that would be, they would just be picking up from where they left off there for sure. But when you get down to it, you know, the law strength of schedule is phenomenal. Like leading up to this fight, this guy, and you cap it off with the, you know, the short notice fight against Burns. Leon's fought good guys. He fought Camaro twice and beat him. You know, um, he beat Colby. I feel like Camaro, or I feel like, I feel like Leon turned a corner after that first or that second Camaro fight. But leading up to that, it's like, he didn't really have the wins that Bilal had, you know, like eight Diaz, like, eh, I, Nate's my boy, but like, I, you know, that's not a, that's not a top five, top 10 welterweight. You know, Bilal is plucking those guys off along the way to get to the title fight. So I think the strength of schedule helped. I think the time with the Dagestanis helped. I think the wrestling heavy approach was, was huge. Um, and he just looked in good shape, you know? So I think Bilal has been preparing his whole life for that moment. And I couldn't be any happy for him for sure. Super stoked for him. Uh, just final thing, not even about you, but the one guy you're close with that's kind of blown me away. I talked to him for every fight is Brady. He stand like, what are you made of his? Yeah. I don't even have the UFC. Like he's, been i yeah. didn't think he'd win that last fight against gary and he kind of surprised me and i think a lot of people with his performance there brady's got that pacific northwest dog in him you know he just he uh he's a great kid man it's it's a pleasure watching him in the gym um he yeah uh, i think the kid's gonna go very very far in the sport i think we've we haven't seen the best of him and uh that takes time you know i and i know because i've been I got in the UFC just a little, a little older than, than when he did. You know, I think he was like 21, uh, 22 years old. Um, so the, there's growth along the, along the way, and he's on a good trajectory. I think he's going to do big things in the sport. I think uh, I'd like to see him get a ranked fight by next year. I think we don't get a ranked fight this next one, but I think the one after that, he goes 4-0 in the, in the most loaded Shark Tank division. UFC. I mean, Bantamweight is absolutely mm. nuts. Like, there's some guys that aren't ranked that just blows my mind. So that that weight division, the fact he's three and zero, it's like big, big things we can expect from this young man. I think that uh, you know we've t- we've touched on me retiring and, and whatnot throughout the course of this interview, but I think when my time is done, whenever that may be, I think um, Spokane, Washington is in good hands. I think that uh, he'll be the new frontman for sure. And whenever I talk to him, he always brings up, he wants a card back in Spokane, you and Juliana, one of you guys can be the main event, he can be right underneath you, and he thinks that's a good event for you guys pretty soon. I would love that. I mean, I've been pushing for it, but I'm I'm, I'm being a little more realistic. I do reach out to Dana and Hunter a little bit, uh, actually more than a little bit more often, <laughs> about like, when are we doing Seattle? When are we doing Seattle? Like, Because that just seems more realistic than Spokane. I think Spokane could sustain a card I think it would get more. I think the gate would sell out faster here 
Like this is a fighting town. Like it's, I can't emphasize it enough. Um, yeah, Spokane Arena would sell out really, really fast. But I think realistically, Seattle's going to be probably the next time they come to the Pacific Northwest. Um, maybe Portland, maybe Seattle. But uh, I think those would be the ideal scenarios for that for that Colby Covington fight. It's been eluding me my entire career. Um, but yeah, sp- the, the Pacific Northwest in good hands, man. We got great up and coming fighters. Um, it's it's just there's something about where we live. Just some tough motherfuckers. <laughs> Well, Michael, I appreciate the time as always. Thanks so much for doing this again. You got it. Thank you.